so much for inviting me to speak. Um, I chose this um, disorder um, for this forum in part because it's something that we're seeing more of. Um, it's a disease that we're probably not recognizing um, um, enough. And the prevalence really is poorly understood and we're learning more about it. Um, so before we delve into what uh, autoimmune gastritis is, I thought we could review um, a little bit about the function of the stomach. So we're going to shift gears from the esophagus down to the stomach. And the stomach um, is a vital digestive organ. It performs chemical breakdown of food with enzymes and hydrochloric acid. Uh, and it, it, it contains specialized cells, including parietal cells, which we're going to talk a lot more about. Hydrochloric acid, and those make hydrochloric acid an intrinsic factor. Um, also, there's, there's other cells, including chief cells, that make pepsinogen to break down protein and neuroendocrine cells. Um, it is subdivided, you could subdivide it into three parts, the antrum, the body, which is where most of the acid is made, and the fundus. Now, besides the chemical digestion um, of food, it, it, it also mechanically breaks down food and has other functions in the body. During digestion, the top of the stomach or the fundus is uh, relaxes, so the stomach can relax and accommodate. Um, also, the, the antrum part of the stomach grinds up food, um, and uh, it is uh, intimately involved in regulating hum hunger and satiety. But it's also subject to damaging factors, including systemic diseases like the one we're going to talk about, infectious agents, and toxins. So in terms of mucosal injury, when we talk about injury to the lining of the stomach, we uh, use the terms gastropathy or gastritis. And gastropathy really is mild epithelial injury and regeneration with very little or no inflammation. And some examples include reactive processes like toxins or vascular uh, or ischemic injury. Gastritis, on the other hand, involves inflammation and it's associated with significant um, mucosal injury. And the most common by far is infectious gastritis, uh, where H. pylori leads the charge, but there's also um, immune-mediated disorders that can affect the stomach. Now, with regards to how we classify gastritis, it could be acute and self-limited, um, in, like in a lot of viral syndromes, but it could also be chronic and it could be nonotrophic and atrophic. And when we talk about atrophic gastritis, uh, autoimmune gastritis and environmental gastritis are the most common. Autoimmune gastritis was normally, uh, formally classified as type A gastritis and environmental uh, formally um, type B, but this one is predominantly uh, H. pylori and environmental gastritis, uh, far, um, it, it's far more common than autoimmune gastritis. And of course, autoimmune gastritis is what we're going to be talking about today. So what is the, the, the definition? So there is autoimmune destruction of gastric parietal cells, and this causes also a decrease in intrinsic factor, which is vital uh, for the absorption of vitamin B12, which is critical for um, a lot of processes in the body. Um, and here, the normal syntic mucosa, which is what makes the acid in the body of the stomach, is replaced by a trophic and metaplastic mucosa. And that carries with it a risk for uh, progressing to malignancy. There's also a uh, decrease in acid secretion. Um, and classically, um, it affects the body and the fundus of the stomach, sparing the antrum, um, which uh, is involved in H. pylori. Um, like H. pylori infection involves the antrum um, always. So this is uh, shows a little bit more of the pathophysiology, but basically uh, the parietal cells are lost and destroyed. And, and um, because of, there's also antibodies made against intrinsic factor, but the bottom line is that this results in malabsorption of nutrients early in the, the disease course, it's iron deficiency later, 
it's vitamin B12. But the other thing that is lost here is that because there is no acid production due to the loss of parietal cells, um, the uh, mechanism uh, to shut off gastrin production, which is the hormone that uh, controls acid production, is um, it's shut off. So basically, there is no feedback. And what you have is a very high level of gastrin, which um, gastrin, um, in addition to um, causing production of acid, it's a trophic um, hormone. So it, it, it increases production of uh, some of the neuroendocrine cells, which can contribute to part of the risk of the malignancy um, that we'll talk about in a little while. Now, when we compare uh, atrophic um, I mean, autoimmune gastritis with environmental gastritis, uh, there are some striking differences, not only in the distribution. So I just told you that mostly uh, autoimmune gastritis involves the fundus and the body. Um, well, classically, that is the case, but in late stages, it could involve the antrum. And patients with autoimmune gastritis can also be infected with H. pylori, which can make things a little bit um, more difficult to, to discern. Um, but classically, H. pylori or environmental um, gastritis is multifocal and involves the, um, the antrum. And there's some notable differences. Uh, first would be in the mechanism where um, autoimmune gastritis, there is a production of antibodies to parietal cells, an intrinsic factor, um, and there is not in H. pylori. And also early in the disease course, although there is, there, there is not a lot of studies looking at this, there is a chronic lymphocytic inflammation in autoimmune gastritis. Um, and uh, later in later stages, there is atrophy, uh, but there is hypertrophy of the enterin chromatin cells um, and clear loss of parietal cells. The, um, there's hematologic uh, manifestations in autoimmune gastritis Early on, it could be microcytic anemia. Um, later on, it would be um, macrocytic um, anemia seen in pernicious anemia. And both carry a risk of malignancy, but with autoimmune gastritis, it's not only adenocarcinoma, but also um, neuroendocrine tumors uh, because of um, the um, gastrin, um, gastrinemia leading to the hypertrophy of the enterochromatin cells. Now, when looking at the prevalence and the incidence of this, um, what I notice is like it's all very, very murky. Um, and that's in that in in, in truth, uh, the prevalence is either over or underestimated. And part of the problem is that the prevalence varies depending on the study design and also the rigor of making the diagnosis. What I found was that then in 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 different studies, uh, the definition of um, autoimmune gastritis was variable. Um, and in some, um, for instance, in some, the just a low B12 level was defined as, as um, autoimmune gastritis. And this is very nonspecific and it's likely to increase, uh, overestimate um, autoimmune gastritis. Other um, measures were pepsinogen level and gastrin level, which both can have issues with sensitivity and specificity. There was also um, parietal cell antibody and intrinsic factor antibody presence. Parietal cell antibodies um, it can occur in, in different disease types, so it lacks specificity, whereas intrinsic factor is not uh, antibodies is not found in many patients with autoimmune gastritis, therefore it would probably underestimate the diagnosis. The gold standard is considered um, endoscopy with biopsy. Now, other factors to consider is that this is a disease where there's a high rate of asymptomatic individuals who probably would not seek any therapy. And also, um, Sometimes early in the course of the disease, uh, when patients are younger, they may present with some abnormalities like a mild um, iron deficiency or B12 deficiency, 
and would be repleted. And if 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 they respond, then no one would ever do an evaluation or follow up. Um, and when someone undergoes an endoscopy, they don't always have a biopsy. And um, in providers who perform endoscopies uh, may be inconsistent in what they biopsies, how many biopsies are taken and where the biopsies are taken. And then there is um, the concurrent H. pylori infection, which can confound the diagnosis. So with all that in mind, uh, the prevalence um, based on the existing studies, um, which are scarce, um, is listed from anywhere from 0.3 to 2.7 um, or 0.5 to 4.5. But if you look at the table, um, there is a much more variation. Um, the, and the prevalence could be from 0.5% to 19%. It's been um, reported. Now, granted that this may also be due to heterogeneity of the study population, but I think more likely it's um, the, the fact that we can't really compare one to the other because of the way um, the, um, the population was defined. Um, now, in the US, uh, they've done their now I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, studies that have involved um, uh, uh, histologic diagnosis. And in, in the U.S., there's been a couple of studies. One uh, was population-based and looked at a um, gastric biopsies that were taken um, in a 10-year period, and this involved 41,245 gastric biopsies. And this was retrospective and... Um, the, there was a chart review looking at histological um, descriptions and looking for the uh, diagnosis of autoimmune um, gastritis or um, autoimmune atrophic gastritis. Um, and what was found was that there was a prevalence of about 1.1%. Um, and it did show that there was a two to one female to male predominance, which is common for other autoimmune diseases. Um, and it seemed to be more common or more prevalent in non-white Hispanic, Hispanic population. When they looked at uh, the diagnosis of autoimmune gastritis um, in patients who underwent a sleeve gastrectomy, uh, in a group of 248 individuals, 0.8% had autoimmune gastritis. In Europe, a cross-sectional study in Austria in uh, a little over a thousand patients undergoing endoscopy found autoimmune gastritis in 2.3%. However, in a Japanese study where they were looking at asymptomatic individuals undergoing a routine endoscopy um, as part of a routine health check, um, and this involved and in, uh, 6,739 individuals found that the uh, prevalence was 0.49%. It's interesting, though, that here, not only did there, there have to be a histologic diagnosis, but there had to be also either um, parietal cell antibody or intrinsic cell antibody for them to, to define it um, as autoimmune gastritis, which probably... Um, in, decrease the sensitivity. So in summary, uh, with existing epidemiological studies, the prevalent estimates are probably inaccurate. However, they do consistently show a two-to-one female predilection, uh, which is consistent uh, throughout and is congruent with other autoimmune disorders. And also, I didn't show this data, but it's pretty consistent that patients um, who have other autoimmune conditions um, uh, are more likely to develop autoimmune gastritis. And this is particularly true with thyroid autoimmune disease and type 1 diabetes. However, conditions like celiac disease, the data that exists is controversial. And in some studies, there seems to be a correlation. In other studies, there isn't. So really, the verdict is still out. Um, so before delving into pathophysiology a little bit more, um, I thought we could review a little bit on how uh, on the physiology of acid secretion. Uh, 
So acid secretion is regulated by several factors, including neural, hormonal, and chemical mechanisms. Um, so when somebody is about to eat, uh, the, the stomach gets ready for digestion. And this is what we call the cephalic phase. And basically, this is mediated through the vagus nerve and parasympathetic effects. Um, and what happens is that there's stimulation um, of cells in the stomach uh, to secrete both gastrin and acetylcholine. Um, and then when food hits the stomach, there's distension um, uh, of the stomach and there's receptors that will, and, the, and also the, the chemicals uh, in the food that uh, will, will feed back to the brain and this will lead to uh, more uh, gastrin production, but also uh, there are some uh, local um, mechanisms by which the stomach can relax and, and change in morphology. And finally, there's also a uh, feedback mechanism. So when their acid enters the small intestine, that is a signal um, that sends signals to stop acid production. Um, and it's one of the things that's messed up in autoimmune gastritis because there is no acid production, so there is no acidification of the um, uh, of the duodenum. Therefore, uh, the feedback me mechanism to decrease the level of gastrin is is not um, it's not functional. Um, and in the um, in these panels, what you'll see is that the parietal cell really is um, the workhorse here. So under the control of histamine, acetylcholine, and gastrin, it produces hydrochloric acid. And the, the problem in autoimmune gastritis is that antibodies are made to the parietal cells and specifically to the potassium um, hydrogen ATPase. Um, and in and we already went over this, but several factors lead to increased, persistently increased levels of gastrin that um, will play into the pathophysiology. Now, pathophysiology is really not well understood at all, but it clearly involves a T cell response and a B cell response. There's been much speculation about what are the triggers, but the reality is we don't know. Um, H. pylori uh, involvement is controversial, and this is based on the fact that there are some proteins in the uh, polysaccharides on the H. pylori cell wall that resemble that of the stomach lining. So it's thought that perhaps in some individual, there could be molecular mimicry that could lead to the autoimmunity. But the reality is that we don't know. And um, following T cell activation, there's, act there's cytokine um, activation um, and then B cell activation with the production of intrinsic factor antibodies and parietal cell antibodies that are thought to contribute to the disease process, but it's also thought that there are mechanisms by which um, there's, uh, the, that causes um, apoptosis in parietal cells. Um, this is all being worked out right now. Um, the autoantigen isn't clearly um, uh, deciphered. What you see on the right side is that the lining of the, the stomach in autoimmune gastritis becomes very thin and flat. I didn't show you a normal for comparison, but usually there's a lot of folds there. And here, what I'm showing you is more smooth mucosa that is lacking the normal folds of the stomach. Um, and this cartoon will indicate more about um, the pathophysiology, I, again, to reiterate what I had said. In a normal case, what you have in the antrum is a lot of G cells that make gastrin. And in the body and the fundus, there's parietal cells, um, which are the purple ones, and some um, enterochromaffin cells, or ECL, and those are the, the neuroendocrine cells. What happens in autoimmune gastritis is that there's a destruction of parietal cells, 
um, gastrin is now unchecked because there's no acid and there's nothing telling the antrum to stop producing gastrin. And that causes hypertrophy of the enterochromaffin cells. Um, so here again, what, what this shows is a very smooth mucosa and atrophy of the, um, of the body or the corpus. Um, with depletion of parietal cells. And indeed, uh, what it shows is that there is an increase in these neuroendocrine cells, which increases the risk of neuroendocrine malignancies in the setting of autoimmune gastritis. Now, the, the problem in the clinical setting is that these patients have no symptoms for the most part. And the symptoms that develop later uh, later stages of the disease are nonspecific and could be found in many different diseases. Um, and most of the time, we make the diagnosis incidentally or because the patients have a late complication, like they have unexplained um, B12 deficiency or iron deficiencies or have um, or present with gastric cancer. Uh, when we talk about the clinical manifestations, there's gastric manifestations and there's extra gastric. Gastric, we've already talked a little bit about where there's atrophy of the lining of the stomach um, and metaplasia, which we're going to talk a little bit more about, but that is the progression from inflammation to cancer. Um, and gastric cancer is the dreaded complication in this um, usually is preceded by dysplasia. And in autoimmune gastritis, you get both neuroendocrine tumors and adenocarcinoma risk. Um, extra gastric um, would be, there's the presence of other autoimmune diseases. Now, this is not really cause and effect. It seems that it's more um, because whatever causes one autoimmune disease is probably a factor in causing the other. Um, and uh, with uh, autoimmune gastritis, we also have vitamin deficiencies, more notably um, vitamin B12, um, but it, there could be deficiencies in vitamin C and iron, um, and there's hematologic consequences, early on microcytic anemia, later um, uh, macrocytic anemias and other cytopenias. So when we compare the clinical characteristics of autoimmune gastritis and H. pylori-associated gastritis, they are similar in the sense that in both populations, there's very little symptoms or very nonspecific symptoms. The serological response is different in that with autoimmune gastritis, if I were to check the gastric level, it would be very high because of the mechanism of action. Not so in H. pylori gastritis because the antrum where the cells that make gastrin reside is also affected. Um, and their antibodies to intrinsic factor and parietal cells only in um, autoimmune gastritis. Uh, and we've already talked about the distribution of um, gastritis where Really, in autoimmune gastritis, it is a predominance of the fundus in the body. Um, and there is an increase in gastric cancer in both. Both these, these um, ent entities could lead to atrophic gastritis, which can progress to cancer, uh, with the only difference being that because of uh, the high gastrin level in uh, autoimmune gastritis, patients with autoimmune gastritis are more likely to develop carcinoid tumors. So how do we manage this? I will say that really there is no treatment for autoimmune gastritis. And really what we do is to determine the extent of involving, and here we'll talk a little bit more about this, but we basically try to map how much of the stomach is involved um, because that, help us, that will help us later on when we're uh, doing surveillance. Also, uh, it's important to identify and treat concomitant conditions. And part of what we do, really, what we do is supportive care where we um, uh, replete micronutrients and we also are um, 
try to look for other autoimmune conditions and other treatable or, or other treatable conditions and things that we could potentially prevent complications from. And then there's a surveillance um, for progression. So this is not clearly defined. Um, currently, most gastroenterologists recommend uh, repeating an endoscopy every three to five years. Um, and um, what's recommended for both determining the extent of involvement and taking and, and for surveillance is to really sample the stomach in a very specific manner where we are taking biopsies in different time points in the, in the um, antrum, in the middle of the stomach, which we call the incisura, and in the body. And basically, we would put these in different bottles. But the reality is that in the United States, very few gastroenterologists are adhering to this, mainly because of um, there is a lack of exposure. Um, and we have to do a better job at increasing awareness and um, and really employing quality measures to make sure that we are um, evaluating these patients properly. When we do diagnose for someone with uh, autoimmune gastritis, um, the strategy that we employ is to characterize it better, looking for markers that we could follow the disease, um, and also making sure that we exclude other things. So sending for antipyrido cells, intrinsic factor antibodies, vitamin levels, um, iron and H. pylori is, is customary. Now, when most of the time when we diagnose this is uh, we encounter a patient in endoscopy who's having an endoscopy for many different reasons, and we notice an abnormality in the stomach. And many times it is at the stage where the stomach is atrophic. And we're trying to understand, is this driven by H. pylori or is it driven by autoimmune gastritis, in which case we will do a workup looking for anemia. Is it microcytic, macrocytic? Is there intrinsic factor antibodies? Is there H. pylori? Is there parietal cell antibodies? And also measuring the vitamin B12 levels to understand if there is pernicious anemia, because pernicious anemia would be a late stage of the disease process and would worry us a little bit more for development of cancer. And also irreversible um, uh, conditions um, due to vitamin B12 um, deficiency. Now, um, in terms of autoimmune gastritis, there's two late complications that make us a little wary. Uh, one is pernicious anemia and the other is gastric cancer. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about. This is a very busy slide, but basically it shows the mechanism by which vitamin B12 is absorbed in the intestine. And normally vitamin B12 is complexed with protein. Um, and in the stomach with the acid, that protein uh, comes off the, the vitamin B12 is released. And there in the stomach, it binds to uh, something called haptocorin. And that goes into the small intestine. And the neutralization of acid in the small intestine then releases vitamin B12. And, and vitamin B12 then is free to bind to intrinsic factor that's made by the parietal cells. And then it travels all the way to the terminal ileum where um, the intrinsic factor B12 complex is absorbed by a receptor-mediated um, process. What happens in autoimmune gastritis of course, is that parietal cells are gone. There is no intrinsic factor. So vitamin B12 um, is not absorbed. And pernicious anemia um, has is a, causes many systemic effects, including neurological symptoms um, like ataxia and impaired vibration, but also psychosis, mood disorders, dementia, um, the, there's hematological consequences, and it could also affect bone health. With regards to symptoms here, really, the symptoms can be very nonspecific, and these are things that we probably find, and most people that we find, dyspepsia, epigastric pain, early satiety, and postprandial fullness, most of them do not have autoimmune gastritis. Now, gastric cancer is the other dreaded complication, 
And here, um, this is really uh, not specific to autoimmune gastritis, but rather uh, once uh, this is a cascade that occurs in chronic inflammation of the stomach. And this could be from helicobacter pylori or autoimmune gastritis. Obviously, these involve different parts of the stomach, but the it's thought to be the same progression. And basically, normal epithelia <laughs> in the presence of chronic inflammation can become atrophic. And the atrophy um, then gives rise to is replaced by intestinal metaplasia. Intestinal metaplasia, this, this is um, a pre-malignant um, changes in the, um, in the cells. Um, and this could progress to dysplasia and um, ultimately to adenocarcinoma. Now, the having a gastric intestinal metaplasia is uh, thought to increase the, the risk of cancer by six to eight fold. Uh, patients with atrophic gastritis are thought to um, have an increase of 0.1 to 0.3 percent yearly risk of progressing to gastric cancer, it, with the caveat that this is based on studies that vary with regard to, um, it has a lot of heterogeneity with regard to patient population and study design. Um, and But patients with autoimmune gastritis who have pernicious anemia um, seem to have a sevenfold increase um, in, in developing gastric cancer. Uh, this uh, just shows that the higher the degree of um, changes to the lining of the stomach, um, the higher the, the likelihood of, of progressing to gastric cancer. Most of the patients that we see um, have intestinal metaplasia. And what we do, and this is an inexact science, would be to repeat endoscopies. Um, usually the interval is three to five years, but some people will do it one year, two year, or some people may do may not do surveillance at all. But the idea would be to sample the stomach and also look for visual um, masses or um, that can be excised uh, to try to prevent progression to cancer. There, the degree of gastritis and intestinal metaplasia can be staged. The most common are the operative link on gastritis assessment staging system and the operative link on gast gastritic, gast gastric intestinal metaplasia assessment. So basically they look at the antrum and the body and score how severe either the atrophy in the intestinal metaplasia is. And what we worry about are people that fall under stage four because those are a very high risk of progressing to cancer. So in summary, um, autoimmune gastritis uh, causes immune destruction of parietal cells and atrophy of the ascentic mucosa. Hypochlorhydria, which means decrease uh, of acid production and intrinsic factor depletion can result in pernicious anemia. Normal ascentic mucosa is replaced by atrophic and metaplastic mucosa that increases the risk of cancer. And the disease is asymptomatic at early stages and the symptoms are nonspecific at later stages, thus making it very difficult to identify the disease. And this Basically, these patients almost always have a delayed in diagnosis. There is no cure and um, no treatment to halt progression. And surveillance is a strategy is employed to monitor for neoplastic complications. So knowledge gap and unmet needs. So like I tried to tell you, um, true prevalence is really not known. There is a need for recognition of this disease at early phase, and early biomarkers are really that will help us pick up the disease at early phases to really understand the true natural history of it are non-existent. There, the precise pathophysiology is not well understood, um, and this is critical to identify therapeutic start targets to. Um, either risk stratify or slow or halt the progression of the disease. There are no reliable prognostic factors. 
proper surveillance interval is really not known. And there, unfortunately, is no standardization uh, for surveillance practices. And we need to employ quality measures so we could properly assess the, the, the risk of gastric cancer. So that would be the end of my presentation. And thank you so much for letting me speak. <laughs>